I started at the University of Kentucky on campus in 1978, and I moved to the Ex Experiment Station or the University of Kentucky Research and Education Center in Princeton. So how did a guy from New York get to Kentucky? It was very easy. I needed a job. Uh, did, did I anticipate staying here, being from New York? No. So things happen um, for the good. Uh, I moved to Kentucky, and the beauty was this place was a collection of plants, no matter where you went. Even if you went in western Kentucky, where there's no garden obvious, the native plants that existed in people's yards um, were interesting. And, and I had, some I had not seen before. I had studied them at Montanic Gardens and around the United States and across the world, thanks to the little U.S. Air Force transporting me for free, um, but I had not uh, actually had the opportunity to go out into the wild and look at plants in Kentucky. And once I did, I met two people from Austin P. who were actually surveying the pl plants of western Kentucky for the development of the dams. They, when the dams were built down there for the land between the lakes, they were contracted, and they had done it years before I showed up, but both of them were still there. So I had the opportunity to visit with them and their predecessors, and uh, they showed me around. Also, if you have an opportunity and you're traveling around, you run into people. Um, again, being from New York, living out west for 12 years and then coming here, uh, I was a little nervous about the, what I call the deliverance factor. <clears throat> you're, hiking, you're hiking in the woods and there's a group of uh, middle-aged gentlemen camping with a fire going in the middle of the week, uh, armed. And uh, yet, uh, this is the Ballard County Wildlife Refuge. Uh, I, are you supposed to be here? Um, <laughs> at the same token, when I'm looking for wisteria, our native wisteria, and I ask them what happened to it, there's supposed to be one at this site, according to Julian Campbell. And, Julian, and they said, oh, they put in that little roadway and cut it down, but there's one as big as you over there. All of a sudden, I'm finding out these guys know all these plants. Uh, that, that are out there, and they were very helpful to me when I first came here. So that's a form of introduction. Uh, so we're here today, so let's move on very quickly. Uh, we were talking about this this morning. This is some data from Dr. Dwayne Ingram and <laughs> our guru down in Texas, uh, who found that between 2003 and 2013, the increase in native plant interest and in sales is significant, and that is documented and published. And so we say, oh my goodness, that's pretty impressive. So uh, just to go through real quickly, uh, some, some, uh, some philosophy. If you have a garden and a library, you have everything you need, I pretty well believe that. Uh, you know, I love my wife and my kids and grandkids and everybody, but, but if you have the first one there, and moderation with glorious exceptions, Robert Mondavi, I, know what he, I knew what he was talking about. So this is all good. Uh, I have a little place in the country. Uh, I had to add deer fence to my list because there was absolutely unequivocally no way to have any kind of a plant in this environment without deer protection. It was just impossible. And I tried everything, every recipe, every protocol, everything you ever heard of, and it didn't work. We do have a limited website called Kentucky Natives that we're slowly but surely filling in with information on how to grow these plants, how to propagate them. And uh, some are quite extensive. I did uh, a resource for international plant propagators on Spigelia and uh, several others, and so those are pretty well extensive. Tom Barnes was our forestry specialist and a, a fabulous photographer. And he did a number of books on wild plants, wild flowers, wild things. And he p started a blog called Kentucky Native Plant and Wildlife. Uh, regrettably, he passed away at a very young age. And so we uh, no longer have Tom with us, but the blog continues on and he did do an excellent job of photography and pictures and images of native plants and I apologize we're gonna to have to do something about that reflection off the greenhouse 
Uh, it's blinding. <laughs> okay, they're going to take care of it. They're good, perfect, perfect, perfect. So the plant of the week, he did these plant of the weeks, and this is one that I was interested in, Western Kentucky, Jack in the Pulpit. We do have plant resource. Wait a second. I'm sorry, she's writing. There's a handout in that folder. Yes, there you go. Would you kind of, would people help pass them along? Uh, I do have a handout, so we're not going to bother with this, anything critical. Uh, when we come to determining whether a plant is native to Kentucky or not, we mostly use uh, Tom Barnes' book because the only thing it contains is native plants to Kentucky. It doesn't include anything that's ever been introduced. And uh, Ronald Jones' Plant Life of Kentucky. So those two books we use for evaluating. You need to keep a record of, your, of what goes on with your garden. Sorry, I'll be right back. Uh, and so I still keep these record books. I think they're very advantageous to write things down so that you can go back and say, I collected this plant or the seed or whatever at this site, and that's where it came from and when it came. In case you don't get any seed to grow for five years, you might decide, maybe I better go back and get some new. Uh, uh, by the way, that picture is in planting fields on Long Island, one of my favorite gardens of all time. And then I've moved down to a smaller book. It helps. I do want to keep in mind that uh, whatever is green, now that I'm older, whatever is green, I used to have big biases about plants, big biases. But now I'm to the point where, eh, you know, even Greenbrier has its place as long as it's not on my property. But um, Peter Del Trecci put out a book called uh, Wild Urban Plants, and it's a very interesting read about how weeds and all these other plants that we think are invasive and everything else, every bad name you want to put on a plant, uh, he finds a value. When he goes to Detroit and he finds concrete that has plants growing out of it, and they tolerate the calcium and everything else, and they're providing an enhanced uh, environment, um, that that's good. But he also says weeds are symptoms of environmental degradation, not its cause, and as such, they're supposed to become increasingly abundant. So that means we need to plant plants, right? We don't want weeds, we want plants, so good. Uh, and then Alan Armitage, this native R and cultivar and all this other argument, I'm, I'm going to pass on it as part of my native plants thing. Um, and we're going to move on to a native plant species, one that occurs naturally in a region. And then a native var, which is a new title, is one that humans had some interaction. And we get into a big argument about this, that, and the other thing. But keep in mind, even our perennials that all look the same are often grown from seed. So that, that does give us some form of diversity within what we're doing. Um, if you really want to know plants, you have to grow them. You have to take them from cuttings or seedlings on up to how they perform. Rick Haig, and that's Rudy Haig's son. He's at the University of Washington. We've talked about him in our tours the last two days as people have mentioned, well, this dwarf form was never released, but it's a Rudy Haig plant, and uh, Rudy Haig euonymus, and Rudy Haig this and Rudy Haig that. But Rich is his son. Uh, I just received an email yesterday that he's closing his firm on the 30th. I think he's 93 or 94 years old. Um, but I think this is true. And as a landscape architect, the lands a leading landscape architect of the United States and the world, and a, and a fairly famous arch landscape architect to say that plants are critically important and his knowledge of plants was uh, an important factor in his success as a landscape architect says a lot for him and his students. So he says plants, we should have form, foliage, flower, fragrance, fruit, and photogenic. Uh, sounds good to me. Okay, okay. I altered the spelling just, you know. And so we're trying to think about a Kentucky local plants project. I do have a lot of slides, but we're going to go really fast because I have a point with a groups of them. So the, the local plants project is that they propagated and be grown within Kentucky to follow on the local foods, to take advantage of this interest in natives and in locals and in local province. So ideally, the plants would be from a known province, whether it's an oak from Jefferson County or an oak from 
where I live in western Kentucky from Caldwell County or Lyon County, we might try to have that type of impact when we sell plants. We have very few native plant nurseries currently in the state. We have David Mikolchek is here. He grows a lot of natives down in western Kentucky, down in the southern Callaway County. Um, we have a new native plants nursery called Ironweed in Columbia. I think it's Columbia. Kentucky, and uh, then we have the drop seed in uh, Frankfurt. Frankfurt, somebody help me. Uh, thank you, shooting star. Okay, so when I first moved to the state, I found these two plants together. I found out uh, from Dick Burr, there's no way to grow that plant. Uh, powdery mildew is powdery mildew, and that's all there is to it. And when people talk about resistance, it's sort of, a little bit, maybe, resistance. So, but this one right here, I didn't know this plant at all. It was by the side of the road. You go out for a run, you go out for a bike ride, and it's by the side of the road. And I said, well, I'll take a look at it. So these are some of the plants we're going to look at. They're on your list that you've been handed. This morning, Matthew talked about this being one of his favorites. Where I live, I dug this up, and I planted it in the gardens at the station, and it disappeared. It is a noxious weed in neglected pastures in Kentucky. Horse people, cattle people, nobody likes this plant. So, it created a problem. Here it is in a pasture, they're getting ready to cut hay, they're not happy about this plant being there. And if you've ever tried to dig this stuff up. Anyway, it's there with fleabane, it's protecting an environment. Do you see fleabane anywhere else? No, it's only where the Amsonia is, so the farmer's not happy. But you bring it into a landscape, and it actually is blue star. It is blue, especially in the shade. So. One thing I wanted to bring up is, as Matthew did this morning, these are things that we can do. We can collect the seed, you can grow it out, you can look for diversities in foliage, which you can find in Amsonia. This is what the seed looks like, those little uh, uh, cinnamon capsules, and you grow them out, and this is the little plants that come up. If little plants don't come up, you did something wrong. So what we, we got to figure out what you did wrong. So that is some of the things that we all run into when we start dealing with native plants that are not in the industry. Amsonia is in the industry extensively, but just as a point. And Hubrechtii, uh, good grief, it's not native to Kentucky. What are we gonna do about that? That's why I limited it. local plants to grown in Kentucky, because we might have to expand the definition just a shade. Um, and if you've ever tried to dig this thing, I mean, there's a woody knot under there like a log and a sharp spade isn't adequate, an, an axe or a backhoe might be the, the thing to have. And so I've tried to divide this thing and found this to be a problem. So growing it from seed is probably the ideal, uh, maybe even cuttings. The green dragon, I only put this in because I found this by accident uh, in my landscape. I live in a condominium and you say, well, how can that be? Where did that, why is that plant there? Well, it's also there with poison ivy and the invasive species that was supposed to be there. The hot, and this little thing here, that's Apios americana. Too cool! But I didn't know that was a thug. I learned that that was a thug. I was so excited, I put it in my home landscape, I watered it, I fertilized it, took over the clematis arbor, took over everything. Now I'm trying to get rid of it, you know. So sometimes you have problems. This is what the small plant looks like when I found out. I thought I had Jack in the pulpit because I actually collected the seed. I didn't. So that's the problem. You go in the woods, and in addition to honeysuckle, uh, you'll find this cluster of red berries. What is it? Is it Jack in the pulpit? Is it green dragon? Hey, ginseng. Maybe ginseng. Well, maybe not. Anyway, this is what the seed looks like. So when you start collecting and start trying to do these types of things, be sure and tell anybody you're working with, like your children, your husband, your wife, your uh, people who work for you, that the fact that there's nothing there doesn't mean there's nothing there. Uh, so, so the people that work for me were gonna throw these trays away. Uh, and I point, had to take them out and point out that there was those little bulblets in there and, and please don't throw them away just yet. Let's see if we can grow something. Uh, I, this to me is one of the most neglected plants ever as far as the ground cover is concerned. It is a native to all areas of Kentucky uh, versus procumbens, uh, uh, Pakistander procumbens, which is not necessarily in every area of the state, even though I think it's a good ground cover. But this particular one, 
Uh, I've found uh, lots of places, but I haven't collected any seed because I can divide it up in those little nodules and, and plant it out and grow it. I hope this thing's telling me. <laughs> okay, I made a minor error in starting that, so somebody yell at me. Um, Cornilla, I put this in because I have put this into every talk as a neglected plant. I do have some followers now, with groups in Cincinnati and others who are collecting some plants for us to try to get some diversity. It's a little teensy uh, um, blue flowering plant. In the wild, you don't even know it's there. When you bring it into the landscape, it creates this mounded small plant that can be grown as a ground, flowering ground cover and it flowers in the summer. So I'm really excited about this particular plant. I'd like to see it developed more. It can be divided. You can collect seed, but they're really small. Um, so we mostly divide it. So these are some of the factors. When you look at a plant, how can you use it? Is it worthy? There's lots of evaluation processes. And as Matthew pointed out earlier this morning, there's failures. You know, 10 years invested in retusis, and now uh, we have an insect that's killing it to the ground. It'll come back, but it's killing it to the ground. This is my favorite, and this is a story uh, about those of you who happen to be gardeners. Uh, I tell the local master gardeners that they can take whatever seed they want from our flower beds, whatever they want. So this fall, the, these two uh, master gardeners, I'll leave the gender out, bring this plant to me and say, we've collected seed off Tennesseeensis for two years, and we don't have any, 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 any plants. And we keep, we keep taking these little things here and planting them and nothing happens. And I said, well, what about those little things there? There's the only seed in this whole head is right there. They said, what? I said, that little thing there. I said, let's go back out there. So we go back out there and I point out that you, if you want to have seed, you got to have a full head of seed on the, uh, because the birds eat it. Small nut hatchers and other birds eat it. So uh, be sure you know what the seed looks like when you're trying to develop and grow a small nursery or start plants for sales or, or, or whatever you want to try to use them for um, because it helps to know what the seed looks like. These can be stored dry and without a problem. Uh, Joe Pieweed is another one that my uh, agronomic people don't necessarily appreciate the plant that much like I do, but at the same token, there's lots of new cultivars and many of them have better foliage and have done very well in the Chicago Botanic Garden trials. Now, the Chicago Botanic Garden is Chicago, so we need to try these plants in ours. Like Baby Joe does really well. I've seen it at the Indianapolis Museum of Art, and uh, I've seen Phantom also. They have a gardener there that tells you to get away from the plant because it attracts too many bees and, and other insects, and they're afraid that you'll get stung or butt bitten, and they'll be sued by somebody. So it is really strange, but I mean, that baby hums. Uh, this is one of my failures. Uh, I saw this plant, it's in my property, it's on my yard, so it's a native, right? It's a local plant, it's everything. It fulfills all obligations, and it has this flower. Holy smokes, I gotta do it. But what happened? I look it up, it's a biennial. Kiss of death, right? <laughs> okay, it's seed. See it have those seeds? That's on a paper towel there, teensy. So, uh, and it takes forever to get the seed to come up, so they're very small. Uh, very small plants, you get a very small germination percentage, uh, but this is what it looks like if you finally wait, wait around long enough. Um, so that was one I gave up on, but I did find it on Plant Delight's website that they do have one that's 6A, that is a uh, Sabidia, Sabatia, how do you say that? Um, but anyway, it is a gentian that might do well in our area. It's not native to us but uh, you, sometimes you have to take, take drastic actions. This is the number one to me, and over the years of my career here, this is the first one I found back in the late 70s, early 80s, and it was developed, it became hot in the industry once Sherry Quito told people how they could tissue culture it. So it's a very attractive plant. The deer absolutely love it. So if it's in bloom, it's gone, if you have deer. Um, but the seed explosively dehisses those little shiny things there. That's what you need to plant, and you need to plant it now. The minute you see that shiny seed, take it and plant it. That's part of the problem. It doesn't store well. As soon as it gets dry and rough, 
uh, you can't really do much with it, so I collected capsules and put them in a dry bag, and zero. So I found out you had to use the shiny seeds and, and directly seed, seed them. So these are the kind of questions when you're trying to grow local plants, either to develop a nursery of your own or to come up with some reason to propagate plants that you run into difficulties. It grows fairly well as a seedling and it's identifiable as a seedling. And so now in my backyard, I have a little native plant garden. And uh, so I harvest the seedlings out of my own garden, put them in pots and take them to work. That's kind of how I expand my collection of spigelia. But as I said, you can divide it, collect seed. Seed's very hard to do. Um, but tissue culture, using Sherry Keto's protocol, uh, makes it a uniform plant in large quantities that can be done by any tissue culture lab. I think AgriStarts is the primary one that uses her protocol and is successful. You can send them your plant out of your yard and they will propagate the plants up to sizable numbers for you if you're a nursery. If you want 10, remember, collect the seed or divide them or pick them up out of the garden. Okay, woodies. I'm, I'm, I'm done, but we're gonna run real quick. Uh, so we've done a lot of work with Woody's. I primarily, <laughs> I just got a thrill out of his mobile home park this morning. Now this is a very bad picture of this plant, but when this plant is in seed, it is a knockout. And I absolutely love it, and it's in a mobile home park. <laughs> so I'm taking cuttings of it and trying to grow and see if it's worthy. I don't know if we want a heavily seeding plant, but we'll try it. Sugar maples, you know, if you see a real one, this is that stone crop, you, you just go, whoo, I think I need one of those. But our number one plant for a good quality ornamental characteristics in Kentucky is Asculus pavia, in my opinion. Uh, it's an outstanding plant. Uh, here it is growing with ostrich fern. Uh, Paul, I've decided that you and I do not have ostrich fern. Whatever those little teensy things that spread across the ground are, they're not, the, they're not it. But anyway, it's a beautiful flower all the way from Florida, all the way up into New York and across the central part of the United States as a native so you can select for your local area, claim it for your province. Uh, this is mine, Armstrong, after Army Armstrong. It's in a particular spot. I know where he collected the seed. He spread it all over West Kentucky. It occurs in all kinds of people's yards because he would carry the seed and plant it in people's yards. Just plant a seed in people's yards in the fall. Um, so it's, this is in uh, Mrs. Champion's yard. I asked Army many years ago if that was his tree. He says, yeah, anybody just like Mike came in, anybody who would let him put it in their yard, that's where it went. So this is a small one in the shade. Collecting seed, remember if the branch is broken, it might not finish. So somebody told me, oh, we got ripe seed on the pavia, and I ran out there and I saw the branch. I said, well, that's weird. None of the others are like that. Branch is broken off, so it's gone ahead and opened. Uh, but this is what we want, nice smooth seed, not wrinkled like that, and uh, rodents are a problem. So if you have a place where you're gonna try to propagate this plant, be sure and protect it from rodents. Paw, paw. well, I'm probably gonna skip on this one because this is a problem I have in the landscape with pawpaw, and then if it survives, it does this. So who knows what the original cultivar was? Because I've now got all these suckers. I don't know if they're root suckers, I don't know if they're uh, seedlings, I don't know what I've got. Uh, it's, a, it's a contribution to our landscape, but it, it's kind of hard to control these things. And as many of you know, there's tons of cultivar, and we had to take our orchard out because too many seedlings came up and too many root suckers occurred to where we could no longer segregate what plant was what. So, difficult. This is at, at the Botanic Garden. This is in my yard. It is a weed. I have a small creek behind my property, and so I get it as seedlings popping up. Buttonbush, very quickly, is an, is an outstanding native. It'll grow in dry, grow in wet, much like uh, bald cypress. But the, thing, the only reason I included them was there's all these new cultivars. Sputnik's been around forever. But now we've got Magic Moonlight. Magical Moonlight was out in the industry, had a different name, uh, kind of all of a sudden people got started saying, hey, wait a minute, that's my plant. And then uh, Sugar Shack by Spring Meadow. Uh, they're supposed to be smaller plants, better structure, but uh, who knows you know, whether that's gonna be or not. Uh, 
Kynanthus, I did the same thing. I'm working on trying to speed up the process on germination, then found out about emerald ash borer. The reason I left it in is this is what I do with the seed to start. I get some perlite, horticultural perlite. I wash the fines out of it, let it drain, use that moistened perlite as my seed storage base, and then I put it in a cooler or whatever's required in order to uh, germinate the seeds, get them properly acclimated or stratified. Um, clematis, I had a little difficulty with this plant. I was collecting the seed and allowing them to cut the tails off and drying it. And then I said, well, okay, we're not gonna dry it. We're gonna just take the seed coat off or we're gonna leave the seed coat on. Didn't matter. What mattered was planting it. This minute I took it off the plant, put it in the ground. If I put it in dry storage, I got almost one or two, three, five percent. So some of these plants you do have to take a few minutes and figure out because it might say in the book you can store it dry, but if you want to get 100 percent or 80 percent or 90 percent germ, you need to, uh, and we got, we got a very good plants and it's doing very well. We're very pleased with it. We talked about persimmon this morning. This is the iconic picture from the Missouri Botanic Garden, uh, uh, Wildmore, Wildmere, a wildlife, wildflower garden and uh, awesome. That is ostrich fern, by the way. That's what it's supposed to look like. Paul and I both have these ones that go across the ground. Can't be, can't be right. <laughs> what about that? It occurs, occurs everywhere but Kentucky. What's that? What is that? No, I know what that is. It occurs in the north parts of all those states, so therefore. Okay, it took me a while to figure it out. American persimmon, we talked about that this morning. We did a trial years ago, and the same, that's how we developed the perlite test was because when we put it in perlite, that's when we got our highest germination. But putting it in peat as an overwintering stratifying works just as well. And this is the results of that study. The other, others were nothing. The others were nothing. Uh, spice bush, my favorite plant. I'm trying to develop a plant. This is typical of its growth, is uh, shrubby. I'm trying, I've collect, found a plant that has straight trunk, single plant, and I now have, whoops, Bob Geneve did some work and found out we didn't do the, do the warm stratification that's in Michael Durr's book. Just go straight to the cooler. And so we got good germination, finally, and good straight plants, and now we have this plant that grows as a single trunk. And out of the seedling population from that particular tree, I get about one to three, maybe four percent that'll break as shrubs and we'll have suckers. The rest of them are all single trunks growing up straight. So I'm pretty excited about that. It might pr prove a different plant for uh, the uh, spice bush swallowtail. And this is what typically we grow in containers for spice bush is this bushy thing here. We mentioned this. The only reason I put these slides in quickly was because yesterday we were talking about Nissa with Mike Heyman. This is his with the glossy, shiny foliage. And this is Philip Powell's Firemaster that's being put out by Greenleaf. And it, it has a unique blotchy type fall color. If you want to grow this plant, you can select from it because five seeds will give you five different plants. I can prove it because this is five plants. Different, fall, what's that for fall color? I mean, and then you got this one, which we all know about. Uh, but a lot of the nurseries all across the, Kentucky and uh, Tennessee are talking about green gable as being a good plant, so I don't know about that. We're looking at, our current study is on white oak, um, trying to grow them more quickly to get a faster plant production cycle. And it's native, we're collecting seed from western Kentucky and growing them out. The initial work is actually from seedlings from forest killing. Weird things you run into, be sure you know about your plant's juvenility and that sort of thing. This is seed I collected off of southern red oak, I was all excited, it's going to be beautiful. Uh, seed popped out right away. What the heck is that? What happened to my, what happened to my southern red oak? Well, it's there, that's it. <laughs> so, because I know where I got the seed from. So some of the juvenility results in some variability, and also we have significant hybridization in oaks. So who knows what we have until we get some age on.